uh, your theme uh, kind of goes along with what we're bringing out and see where we're all at. But uh, verse 32, <clears throat> Psalm chapter 37, he said, The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. And uh, man, we know that's true because he said there would be a time coming that whoever kills you would think that he's doing God's service. And um, we don't see a lot of that, I guess, uh, here in the United States like they do in other places. I know in Nigeria and some of these other countries, there are still people that are dying just about every day for their faith. And uh, we think we have it hard if somebody looks at us cross-eyed a little bit. And uh, yet there are people who are giving their life for this gospel. So uh, they are watching. But with the fact that they're watching, it also gives us an opportunity to let our light shine and, you know, lift up the name of the Lord in spite of the persecution. Because uh, the Bible said where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I like in verse 33, he said, The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. In other words, just because the wicked is watching to slay, God's not going to abandon us. That doesn't mean that God abandons us. Sometimes I think the modern church here, you know, in the United States has kind of got it backward, and we think that if we go through a little persecution that somehow God's abandoned us. But uh, the Bible does tell us that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And what do you think that is, anybody? What do you think that... Uh, tribulation, work with patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. What do you think that that brings hope? Tribulation troubles. You have to have faith to have that. Trust in God, and he'll deliver you, just like David is here always. And I love how that he words it, tribulation, work with patience, because sometimes no matter how much you'd like to rush and get through it, you got to wait it out. And too, you know, uh, tribulation, when you go through that, you know that God is the one that brings you through it. Oh, I yeah. Mean, if you didn't have troubles and trials, he wouldn't be real to you as much as the good times and the bad times. Right, right. And the patience brings experience because you ought to be able to look back and say, well, if he delivered me last time, he's going to deliver me this time. Right. And so... Uh, it's not always a, a bad thing. Do you find it hard to have patience? Well, a lot of people make the mistake and they don't realize what they're asking. And they say, Lord, give me more patience. <laughs> and tribulation is what brings patience. I mean, you know, being put in a position, I've had to learn how to just wait. It does say just wait upon the Lord. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and we, I guess, make it overcomplicated because we're like, well, what can I do while I'm waiting? And and I preached a message one time from Isaiah 40 and 31. The Hebrew word there for wait means to weave. And what he's saying is that you have to take your faith and your prayer life and, and all those experiences and you weave that together. Because sometimes, um, just being honest, anybody ever feel like your faith gets weak? <laughs> well, that, that's good that we're honest because it does happen. So you have to weave that faith in with the Word of God, the promises, because even though our faith might be weak, we know God's Word is true. And so we weave that together, and then we weave that with our prayer life and getting in prayer line. And what does the Bible say? A threefold cord is not easily broken. So sometimes the mistake we make when we're going through persecution is we try to handle it ourselves. Or we lie to ourselves and we think, well, I don't want to bother nobody. And, you know, as I often said, uh, if you've ever watched an animal program on, like, Animal Planet, what do the predators do? They always go after the one that's isolated, don't they? They try to weed them out or separate them from the rest of the herd. But that's why church is so important. There's strength in numbers. And we're supposed to be, you know, having the same care one for another, that if you can't raise your hands or you can't pray for yourself, that somebody else can come along and stand in the gap for you and pray for you. And I know that, you know, back in, when we were young and, and our first child died, I needed that. I couldn't pray for myself. I was low. I was, you know, dealing with grief, and I needed somebody to come along and pray for me and with me. And I thank God for the church because 
you know, they stepped up. So, uh, any other comments? But uh, he, he tells us here in verse number 34, there's that word we don't like, wait. <laughs> you know, we get kind of impatient. And it always amazed me, you know, being around fast food places that sometimes people get so mad waiting just a little while and yet it's fast food. You know, I had to wait a whole extra minute. <laughs> I mean, you know, and uh, or they'll, you know, sometimes get upset at the microwave that things don't happen faster. But he said, wait on the Lord and keep his way. In other words, don't let the fact that things are not going the way you want them to cause you to turn from what's right. You know, my parents always used to make this statement, two wrongs don't make a... Yeah, and so uh, he said, wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. So, man, what a promise that is in verse 34, that if we'll keep his way, even though we're having to wait, you know, it's kind of like the little kids sometimes. You ever had a little kid get on your nerves? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And uh, you tell them, you know, or what time is it? Well, it's five minutes later than it was last time you asked me. And we laugh about that, and we think, well, those are children. But we do God the same way sometimes. We want God to move yesterday. And we don't realize that there's a process. And God has a timing, and God's timing is perfect. You remember how in John 11 that Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But yet, what a good promise this is. This is something I have, you know, checked and underlined and marked because it's one of the things I like to go back and read, especially when I'm having to wait. I know sometimes it can be even discouraging when you look at other people and it seems like they're getting their answer real quick. And you're like, well, I'm paying my tithes and I'm doing my thing and I'm doing everything I know to do. Why am I having to wait? I mean, look how quick they got theirs. But again, that's them. And the Bible said you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So don't let what somebody else is going through or how God's moving in their life cause you to be discouraged. He said in verse 35, I have seen the wicked in great power spreading himself like a green bay tree. And uh, <clears throat> not adding to or taking away, but uh, I guess if I would have said that or explained that, I would have used the word kudzu. I mean, they just take over. The wicked, you know, a lot of times they just <laughs> spread out and they just keep going and trying to overtake everything. But just because they set themselves as a green bay tree doesn't necessarily mean that they're all that they, they think they are because if a man thinketh himself to be something when he's really nothing, he deceiveth himself. So he said, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. And I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. So we got something to strive for, that if we'll do the right thing, God said, the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, and the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Why? Because they trust in him. So I love how that he ends it on a positive note because sometimes when you talk to people, they get down and out, and they get in that gloomy spirit, and they don't have anything to, you know, what's good about it, you know, and they just want to get negative, and death and life's in the power of the tongue, and if you don't watch, you can put yourself in a mood. You ever got in the mood and ended up sinking lower before you climbed up out of that pit? You can cause yourself a lot of heartaches. You I can. Mean, you? you really I mean, can. I mean, walk with your head up, not down or whatever, and look up and not down or whatever. You know, I've always had an optimistic view of God. I've right. always had I love a testimony. They asked Jack Cole one time. They said, aren't you afraid to pray for people in wheelchairs, you know, about getting up? And he, you know, they said, aren't you afraid of that percentage that doesn't get up? And he said, I don't dwell on the percentage that don't. I look to the ones God has touched and how God has healed. Right. And sometimes, though, we weigh things out. Have you ever tried to weigh things out before you moved with God? 
If God said move and you're trying to go, but if I do this and they say this and then this is going to happen and, and you're trying to get everything lined out and sometimes you miss that opportunity just to move. My parents always did this. You always ever do this because I said so? Yes. <laughs> but why? Because I said so. And uh, sometimes, though, that we uh, we do God the same way. God say, you know, go to the altar. Why? Well, it shouldn't matter why. It should be the fact that he said go. And uh, I did a little devotion the other day on where he said in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing. And I said, I'm seeing people's confidence come under attack now more than ever. And songs don't get sung, messages don't get preached because people have such a lack of self-confidence. But if God said it and God give us that gift, we need to move. But any comments on this uh, chapter 37 before we get into chapter 38? All right, as we get ready to look at chapter 38, what do you think part of the theme is, or at least for chapter 38 before we get in? What do you think this chapter 38 is dealing with? All right, I hear one. Anybody else besides Paulette? <laughs> My Bible says, bring to remembrance. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, you ever know anybody that dwelt too much on the past? Mm-hmm. You know, and <laughs> being honest, how many made mistakes? We all have. But you can't live in the past, can you? But there does come a profit sometimes from dealing with some of the things in your past if you can learn from it, but you don't stay there. You don't live there. And some people want to go back and tell you every ungodly thing they ever done. Does it? I don't need to hear all that. I just need to know God's brought you out of it. You know, and, and so we have to make sure that we don't end up glorifying the mistakes instead of glorifying the fact that God picked us up out of that horrible pit. And so it is about penitence or forgiveness or realizing that he need to have forgiveness. And can you name anybody in the New Testament that kind of had a same mindset as David? One man comes to mind right off the bat, but let's see. Well, he's one. There's another one. I'll give you a clue. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul. Paul. Paul, because Paul, Paul, uh, I sometimes wonder what it must have been like to know that God saved him, and yet he was there when they stoned Stephen, and he had been a persecutor of the church. And those are not what we would call typical mess-ups that we would have in everyday life. I mean, he was a persecutor of the church. and And so Paul... You know, he said, of sinners, I'm chief. And he realized the mistakes he made, but uh, we have to be careful to remember that if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. New creature. All right, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure, which is pretty self-explanatory, that uh, David is saying, you know, God, I, I I know I've messed up, but I don't want you to be really mad at me because, you know, he know that uh, God was a mighty God. He said, For thine hours stick fast in me, and thine hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. And this is something that we really do need to see is we need to see that sin makes us uncomfortable. Some people, though, have had their hearts so hardened that they don't feel that condemnation anymore. The Bible even speaks about a time where the bed being so short they can't lay on it and the covers being so small they can't wrap up in it. But now a lot of people look at you and not feel condemned at all. They'll lie to you right in the, right in the face. This is, this, is one, this is one thing that, David, you don't hardly see him talking like this, you know, he's always speaking based on what God has done, and, and here he's remembered, I know. Oh, yes. That's why I thought it might have been his sin with Bathsheba. Well, you're going to see touches of him and Bathsheba all the way up until about chapter 51, because that sin carries a consequence, and a lot of times people don't see that. I mean, you talk to them, and it's, I'm good, it's all good, you know. 
You believe in God? Oh, I believe in God. You going to heaven? Yeah, I'm going to heaven. Are oh, you say, well, I don't go to church. I don't pray, you know, but I'm fine. I'm fine. And, you know, we need to pray. I, I really feel like now more than ever for condemnation to come on people that are lost. Conviction. You know, I remember, man, there was a time that folks would get so uncomfortable when the preacher would preach, they'd run to the altar or they'd run for cover. You know, they'd try to get out of there. And uh, so uh, we uh, we really do need to pray about that because they should not be able to sit under the word of God so comfortably that it doesn't bother them. You know, thank God. Uh, for conviction, I, I've told you this before, but I remember one Thanksgiving service, they were asking, what are you thankful for? And I said, for conviction. I said, you know, other people can do a lot of things, but if me and my wife have words and a little cross, I said, I feel like I've murdered somebody. And I thank God for that. Don't that make you feel close to God? Though? Yeah. Don't. Know that he knows you. Oh, that yeah. Person. That, you know, you can pull the wool over some people's eye, but you can't pull it over God's, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of people have a lot of ideas about that, but I like what one preacher said. He said it's very specific, said it was a messenger of Satan. You know, he said a lot of people think it's eyes or this problem or that problem, but, you know, sometimes it just boils down to something the devil reminds us of. You ever had something the devil tried to remind you of over and over in conviction, cause you to, you know, kind of step back and not approach God the way that you should? Well, he'll do that. Talking about her, I can't remember the situation tonight. That he, uh, he was talking about sending them a, a big letter. Yeah, that I've written with my own hand, a large, talking about the letters being large. Yeah, he was talking about them large letters. He's blessed with and he's anxious with his eyes. Oh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of folks have a lot of ideas about those things, but I guess really out of these first few verses, the thing that impresses me is the fact that conviction has its place but you know over the last few years church has become a seeker sensitive thing and we don't want nobody to be uncomfortable you know and i think that's a wrong attitude because i think we need to remember this is a holy god this is a holy house and when we come into his presence he don't need me but i need him i need him all right he said uh, for my iniquities are going over my head as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me my wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. And uh, again, you can look back sometimes in life and think, man, I should have known better. I wish I hadn't have done that. But thank God for grace. That's the only way out to it. Yeah, because you can wash, you can do all kind of thing, but uh, only, only grace. Grace faith. Yep, only grace. He said in verse 6, I'm troubled, I'm bowed down greatly. I go in mourning all the day long. And boy, sin can get you in a mess, can't it? Get you in a fix. And that's why there are people, you, you talk to them sometimes, and they'll say, man, I'm having a big old time, but they look like they're dead on the inside. You ever seen them? I call them the walking zombies. I mean, you know, they, they, they're they miserable. And that walking dead really, really fits them, though. It does. Because they got no peace deep down in their heart, and they're always looking for something else to fill up that void. He said, my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there's no soundness in my flesh. I'm feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it's gone from me. He's talking about what sin can do. And, and again, sin is something that I think has been whitewashed over the last several years. And people say, oh, it's just a mistake. God understands. And, you know, we all mess up. And the Bible says in Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And so it's something serious, something not to take lightly. I'd rather have somebody <coughs> to preach me. Uh, that I'm, well, the word of God has all power. I'd rather have somebody preach me the truth with power and with the anointing that comes from God than I would somebody to just 
say it'll be all right or, or, or prosperity, a prosperity preacher. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Because you, you can't grow. You can't grow like that. Everything's not prosperity. It, it's, it's really not. And if you're not careful, we have focused only on the sweet things. I mean, I like dessert as good as anybody, but you right. can't live on it. No, you can't. You'll die. Right. And uh, 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 that's like, I, I don't want to say too much. I may preach on this Sunday, but I've been studying uh, the qualifications of a hypocrite. <coughs> now, we, we talk about it as a byword, you know, say, oh, they're acting like a hypocrite. But do you realize when you live one way and and you claim another there are a lot of things the Bible has to say about a hypocrite, about his joy being temporary. His laughter is like the crackling of thorns under a pot. In other words, it soon passes. And so it's dangerous to live and to end up deceiving your own self. His whole life is a lie. Yeah, there's no, there's no foundation in it. And there are a lot of people... A lot of people who who live that kind of a life, but it's something we just throw out as a kind of a, as a byword at people, and we say, "Well, that's hypocritical." But there's a lot of people who live one way and profess something else, and God God warns us over and over through Scripture that it's not a good thing, that it's it, it's uh, it's detrimental to us in more ways than we realize. Uh, he said, my lovers and my friends, verse 11, stand aloof from my sore and my kinsmen stand afar off. Sin will separate even even families. I hear a lot of people make this statement. They say, well, I ain't hurt nobody but myself. I disagree. Sin will uh, have results even in those that you love and you care about around you. He said, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me. They that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I am as a deaf man hurt not, and I was a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was a man that heareth not, and whose mouth there are no reproofs. And uh, I think verse 14 has a whole lot more in it than what we realize, because a lot of times when people keep sinning after a while, their heart gets hardened on it. And he said, I was as a man that heareth not. A lot of times you can tell them, you can show them. And I know when we were a kid, we would agree with mom and dad real quick because we thought that would stop the lecture. I know, I know, yep, okay, yeah, yeah, I know. And sometimes we do God the same way or God's people. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and they say, well, I know, I know. Sounds like the parable where the ears, they can hear. Yeah, I mean, I Actually, tell somebody. You're right. Because they don't want to be told, even if you tell them out of that's love. Exactly right. and well, well, that's what he's saying. Yeah. You know, he said, I was as a man that heareth not, right. and in whose mouth there are no reproofs. They don't want to hear nothing contrary to the way they see things. That seems to sound like the scribes and the Pharisees. And, you know, in other, in other times he spoke to them, you know, in parables, like the ears that they could not hear with eyes they could. To not say, but this one right, this this one right here, they understand. Right, but the most powerful thing, reader, that you do in those cases is you pray that God soften their heart, because sometimes you may plant a seed that will bloom later. You know that they will remember. Sometimes it's not that they have a hardened heart; it's just that they don't want to think that what they're doing is wrong. You know. Right. What is he saying, man? In his own heart, he's... As a man thinketh in his own heart, so is he. Yeah. A man's ways are right in his own yeah. eyes. Yeah, right, right in his own eyes. And, and uh, when your heart is in that, you cannot reach that. I mean, if you if, if their uh, ears are, you hear that, you can't, you can't get past that. Anger is that. Well... Uh, maybe this would be a little bit of an illustration. Have you ever maybe had somebody tell you, you can't eat that, that's going to make you sick? Yeah. Oh, that ain't going to bother me. <laughs> and then you end up eating it and it makes you sick and they're there to go, I told you so. I heard that and sometimes it's not just in what we eat, it's things that we do. You know, you keep jumping off that, you're going to end up getting hurt or whatever. And uh, 
sometimes, you know, God will tell us and he'll tell us and he'll put people in our path. And why is it that we have such a nature that sometimes we got to learn the hard way? Well, I tell my nephew that all the time. Bless his heart. <laughs> I mean, I do. But I love him. Right. But he doesn't want to hear it because he thinks he's right. Right. And, you know, I want to get angry at him, but I know that that's not the right thing to do. Well, you so know, I there's... there's mothering with love. Right. I think that there's a fine line between righteous indignation, meaning to be angry in the fact that they won't listen, get mad at the devil, realize it's the devil that's the enemy that's blinded him and not him as a person. And it should upset us that, that our people won't listen and that they have to be hard-hearted. And I've seen people go through terrible things knowing that they didn't have to go through it if they had just turned to God. And that's hard, but you can't do it for them. I know as a parent... You want to put a Band-Aid on it. You want to kiss it, make it better. You want to fix it. And, you know, that's the hard part of ministry is letting people go to their own device. I believe a lot of people know they're wrong with what they're doing, too, but yet they will not turn. And the world is pushing this mindset of, well, only God can judge me, but they don't understand that when he does, it's too late then. It's too late. Yeah. It's too late. Yeah. No, no, I don't. I don't agree with that. And uh, I always say the Bible trumps everybody, everything. And God's word is what I need to turn to. And it's sad today that if you won't let somebody do something here, you know, if you stand up for truth, there's some church somewhere that'll let them get by with it for the sake of a number. You know, the Bible said that um, people will have each and ears and will turn from the truth. Anybody else got another comment before we go on? Just like Darrell said, take your life. See, uh, I don't get the right words out. But uh, to me, but this word is right. You say, but, but I may not be, but this word is right. And. You know, I've made this statement. I believe you can be right in your heart with God and be a little off in your doctrine. By, by that, I'm saying that, you know, when I was young, I didn't understand things fully more like I do now. And I believe I was just as saved then as I am. You know, it's just you learn as you go along. That's an the blind will lead the, the blind will lead the blind. They'll both, they'll both fall in the ditch. They'll both fall in the ditch. And so you have to you have to constantly examine yourself and see where you're at, because people have opinions, people have ideas, and uh, and again, if you hear and you're in the environment of a certain doctrine, you might think that's the way it is until God convicts your heart and God begin to deal with you, and God's the greatest revelator. I mean, that's one of the jobs of the Holy Ghost is to bring the light, the Scripture, to bring the understanding of the Scripture, and. Uh, I know I was raised in a church that didn't uh, didn't see things a lot the way that I do now, but it was because many of them couldn't read, and so they just kind of preached what they heard, and a lot of what they heard wasn't right, you know. But he said in verse fifteen, and and I like this. He said, "For in thee, O Lord, do I hope." And think about all the persecution, the mistakes, the groaning, the things that he's talking about. And now in verse 15, he said, But for in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou will hear, O Lord, my God. I'm glad that when it's all said and done, we can still hope in the Lord. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. In other words, a lot of folks are quick to point out your mistakes. You see what he did? Oh, some man of God that is, you know. But, you know, again, I love what Paul told the church at Rome. He said, what should we then say to these things if God be for us who then could be against us? He said, for I'm ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity and I will be sorry for my sin. 
In other words, if I've messed up, I need to admit that I messed up. And I need to repent. But my enemies are lively. They are strong. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow that the thing that is good. In other words, why does a man have enemies? Because you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to follow what's good. And there are a lot of people today, just because you're a Christian, you know, they'll they'll be against you. But he, that's right. And, uh, you know, to me, that's where I think you have to rightly divide. Now, a lot of times we take things out of context. You know, people get persecuted and they want to go into that Old Testament and they'll say, well, the Bible says, you know, uh, uh, do my prophets no harm. That's under the Old Covenant, you know. But under the New Testament, Jesus said, if they've hated me, they're going to hate you, you know. I'm not of this world. And so us being not of this world, they're going to hate us too, you know. Touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. And we all know what happened to them kids that cursed Elisha. He called the she bears out on them and and everything. But under the new covenant, persecution is going to happen. He said, make haste and help me, O Lord, my salvation. I'm glad that he will, that he's a God that will help in spite of our sins and our mistakes. If we repent, there's help for us. Any comments on chapter 38? All right, chapter 38 was kind of a prayer for penitence uh, or being sorry for his sin that he committed. What about chapter 39? What kind of theme do you see? What about you, Paulette? Well, I like where he said on over in Psalms, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What would be another way of saying that? Taking stock of your days, taking inventory of your life, prioritizing. All right, chapter 39, verse 1. Very good scripture here. I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Hello. A lot of times, as I said before, we, you know, what's the saying people use? They say, well, he shot his mouth off. You can uh, deny or you can accept. Speak for, you know, slow to speak because... uh, have you ever noticed this, and and I know this sounds bad in, in a sense, but if you're not paying attention, you can end up telling a lie without realizing it. I, I seen a guy talking to another guy the other day, and the guy was just sitting there going, yeah, 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 and then he went, whoa, wait a minute, what? And he just he, he just agreed, you know, to something that, that wasn't actually true. And have you ever done that? Have you ever let your mouth get ahead of your brain, so to speak, and, and said one thing when it really wasn't true, and you had to back up and go, didn't mean to lie, Lord, you know, forgive me. And and it can happen. I, I, I've seen that happen, uh, you know, back when I was growing up, people would call him, and, uh, you know, Dad, he worked at night, so he was asleep, and they'd say, didn't get you out of bed, did it? You know? Uh, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm up, I'm, you know. And so, yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, I love how that he said this. He said, I'll take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Because, man, what gets us in trouble a lot of times is the tongue, isn't it? Full of deadly poison, isn't it? And uh, I've heard people have this testimony. Oh, you got to watch them. They got a mouth on them. And, uh, yeah. Because that's what you confess with. And listen to what he goes on to say. He said, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. You ever you ever grumble? You ever grumble, though? You want to reply, and you don't reply, but you're sitting there going, you know, <laughs> grumbling, wanting to respond. And there are a lot of times I've wanted to say things, the Lord just say, hold your peace. And you're sitting there going, it's not time to speak. And, and so there's a lot of wisdom in this first verse. Yep. And I found out when I was young, 
sometimes a horse could get so used to that bridle that the bridle didn't mean a lot to it. No. I mean, you know, when you're riding out, you know, it knows I've got a job to do. I've got to carry you out this far. But when you turn around to come back to the barn, they know that they're going back to the barn and they want to get that saddle off and they want to get that grain and that hay. And a lot of times they'll pull and you're hitting, whoa, whoa, I said, whoa. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's the same way with our mouth. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our situation that God's trying to br- bridle us and, and rein us in a little bit, and we end up. I've had to. I've had to go back. Anybody want to be honest? If you ever had to go back and realize that you said something before you realized that you and you had to say mm-hmm. sorry about that. <laughs> yep, that's why I tell them we like soul food at the church. <laughs> we we uh, stick our foot in our mouth sometimes. Verse 2, he said, I was done with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned, and then I spake with my tongue. Lord, make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days. What is it that I may know how frail I am? Boy, when I was young, I thought, man, I was go on forever. And now you get older, you get aches and pains. I, I was telling them one time I got up and thought, man, my floor's creaking. Realized it wasn't my floor, it was my joints. But, I mean, seriously, though, when you realize how frail you are, that means that you realize that your time could come at any time. It makes you walk more uprightly because you realize you may not have another five, ten years to get things right. You need to walk as if he's coming today. I thought that was more like spiritual. That well, I think there's a literal application that we can look at because, you know, every day that we have, it's a gift from God. And w- there's just as many young graves as there are old in the in a lot of the cemeteries. And so I think we really need to be mindful that we're not meant to live here forever. But we're going somewhere. And so... I like how that he said, make me know how frail I am. Yeah, like trusting him and trusting in him, you know, uh, and depend upon him, you know, not not physically, but spiritually. You know what right. I'm well, even, even in the physical sense, because, I mean, it's God that gives us power to, you know, to live our lives and put things together. Nothing really we've done, have we done of ourselves. Um, I mean, it's God that puts the pieces together in our life if we'll look to him, him move and have our being. Thought of that very scripture. You know, it's on my way to church, which reminds me of a conversation with someone who's not saved. When I picked up Anita, her brother-in-law, he was just telling me we need to get thanked when we get up, have a purpose to get up, you know, and thank that we're alive today mm-hmm. and what we're going to do, you know. And I thought, you know, he, he, I just felt that today. I just want y'all to pray for him because I feel like he, uh, he's grateful for his days and he realizes that. And a lot of people are so close except, you know, they haven't made that profession, haven't come on over. They're mindful of some things. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I can see a big change in the last several years of how things are. Can't you? You know, spiritually speaking and... And I remember there was a time that I could get up and and I had at least this many choices any day of the week of churches I could go to. Many of the old men that had those churches open are dead and they're gone on. And and I remember there was one little holiness church in Maryland that we used to go and preach for two or three times a year. And they had 212 in Sunday school. And uh, the old man died and wasn't long after that, 212 turned into 28. And it happens. And so we need to really realize that today's a gift. And once today's gone, you'll never get it back. This is a day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad therein. Verse 5, he said, Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and mine age as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. In other words, man, we need to really listen to that and, and realize that. I've heard people think, you know, that they were all that. They used to have sayings, they'd say all that and a bag of chips. 
but we're not. I mean, man, without him, I surely wouldn't want to try to make today without him, would you? He said, surely every man walketh in vain. Shoo. Surely they're disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions and make me not the reproach of fools. And it kind of reminds me of later when David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. What's most important is eternity. <coughs> it really does. It really does. He said, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove the stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thy hand. When thou, when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. I believe here he's just talking about how life can go by so fast. And there are a lot of people who think they're living it up, but there's only pleasure in sin for what? And then afterwards, you know, you got to pay for that. you got a judgment. He said, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, and all my fathers with thee. O spare me, that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. And uh, so it's really leading up to where now in the next chapter he's going to be very thankful, and he's going to say a lot of things that uh, are really relative to our everyday life. But can you see how relative the book of Psalms can be to our everyday life? There's so many things that we encounter, people that we meet, things that we go through with. And um, so he's remembering his sin, remember the price of his sin in chapter 38. Then he's talking about how vain life is and how that our hope is in the Lord. And now in chapter 40, uh, He's talking about how God delivers us. And so the pieces of the puzzle actually begin to fit together really nice. Any comments before we start chapter 40? Hope you're getting something out of this. Don't want to bore nobody. Chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Boy, isn't that a good scripture, especially after everything that we've just read? But sometimes being patient's hard. I mean, have you ever had a kid that's been wired up on sugar and chocolate? And you say, sit still for just a minute? They're kind of like that uh, car, you know, in neutral, you know. You can hear that motor running. They're just waiting for you to take the foot off the brake. And... Uh, just kind of, you know, live wire. And sometimes when we're waiting, we get so discouraged. Devil throws fiery darts. Has the devil ever told you God's not listening? Or maybe you've done something? He does, don't he? But what's the devil? He's a liar and the father of it. One of my favorite scriptures, he brought me. I like how he makes it personal. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Oh, now, you look like you've always had it together. <laughs> you you ain't been in trouble like I have. You don't know where I've been. Well, David said, I don't know about you, but he said, I was in a horrible pit. I wasn't, I wasn't just a religious person, but he said, I was in a horrible pit. And he said, he, he brought me up. So that means sin will take you down. Brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet up on a rock, and established my goings. And when God brings you up out of a situation, out of that miry clay, sets you on a rock, which means he gives you a foundation, and then he establishes your goings, meaning that you can live from there on out, that you can, you can have life. He said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Any comments? Do you remember where God brought you up out of? Remember how great it was that he brought you up out of it? And then not only did he bring you up out of it, but he gave you a foundation where you're not up one minute and down the next and up one minute and down the next and he established your going. And with that comes some benefits. Verse 3, 
And he had put a new song in my mouth. In other words, I'm not singing the same old stuff that I used to be singing when I was down in that pit. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. <laughs> if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Well, he put a new song in my mouth. Then that means our, 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 our songs should change. There should be a newness about that. Even praise under our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. That's why, again, that if uh, you're saved, there needs to be a change in a lot of ways. You can't keep doing the same old things and expect to grow. Oh, man, I have such good memories of that, Brother Winford. I can remember there was a little old lady named Melster. She had that little hairpins and them hairs all placed right back, and she'd get to singing it. She's so old and feeble. And the Holy Ghost would just begin to fall and begin to move, and like a wave through the church, people begin to shout. And I never have forgotten that. And that newness is one of the great telltale signs that we're on the right track. Blessed, verse 4, is that man that maketh the Lord his trust. You want to be blessed? Put your trust in the Lord. He said, and respecteth not the proud, nor of such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward that cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than could be numbered. In other words, God, you've been better to me than I can even put into words. Can't tell it all. They used to sing that song when I was growing up. He's been so good to me, I cannot tell it all. Well, that's, that's like me. When the Lord saved me, I had a bunch of old records there. I had 78, 45, country music. One day I just took them and stuck them in the trash can. Amen. I said, I'd rather listen to a good gospel song any time than one of these other songs. Amen. When I got saved, I laid everything else down. It takes a good night to make to grow in this. You know, it does. I mean, you got to want the things that are good and of God if you're going to grow. And, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that I've seen people come and I believe had a legitimate experience, but then end up feeding their flesh, propping it up, and then wonder why they couldn't make it. You know, you can't keep running down that same old trail. If there's no change, it's a red flag. There's something wrong. And uh, I've seen people prop up their flesh. And I know a lot of people get mad when you talk about things like this. But, but again, I think it's, it's beneficial. Because bottom line, and this, this gets real tight, but he said whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if it's promoting, you know, the wrong thing, it's really not good for you. It may not be out and out bad, but I, here's something that blew my mind. I'll say this and go on, but I seen a post the other day that said that there was a, a new voice in some of this modern Christian music, and it's a transgender person calling himself, he, he proclaims to be a girl, Flamey Grant, like Amy Grant. And the song has reached number one on whatever kind of charts, and I think that that's sad that they would even qualify that as a Christian song when it's by somebody who's totally against everything that we stand for. And so we're in a time, and have been for a while, where they're called good evil and evil good. You know, most a lot of people, I say this transgender person will draw a bigger crowd than anybody hardly out there. Oh, yeah. Because, because of the way the world is now. And before, you know, they used to say, you know, when they rock and roll stars and stuff, you know, if they had a gay or a homosexual person, in, they didn't tell anybody. But now I saw them interviewing some nowadays, and they, they want to make that to the forefront of when they uh, do things now because it's more popular. Now, and the world loves its own. Yeah. You know. And, uh. Over there, if you go overseas, I can't think of the place over there. But 
they was uh, talking about just one that one there, beauty contest. And it's sad. It's sad. But I, I think that here in this scripture where he's talking about all the things that we have allowed the enemy a lot of times to rob us of our testimony. We don't brag on Jesus as much as we should. And the world, they brag on their agenda. They lift up their agenda. And why why don't we? I, I never will forget one time I pulled up to a red light and uh, this young couple made a mistake of blasting, you know, their music at me. I had a good stereo at that time in my vehicle. And I had a black gospel tape. And they were singing, have a little talk with Jesus. And I went to flat footing from the sitting position. And they thought I was the nut, you know, went to rolling their windows up because, you know. You know. Oh, yeah. I, I, I you know, I was raising my hand praising the Lord and. And uh, getting excited because, you know, uh, it was, uh, I used to, uh, and I think it's sad, uh, the Azusa Street, they had some really good old songs uh, that they sung. And uh, you don't hear good, good, joyful gospel music like you once did, you know, in a lot of places. We need joy. We need joy. The joy that I work with, I mean, he was so withdrawn. And he talked to me. But then today, he, he wears the word, this shirt that says something about Christ on it. I can't remember exactly what it says. But yet, he's over here hanging out with this other young boy that normally is outside working. And the filth that's coming out of their mouth is, and I'm thinking, you're wearing that shirt and you're talking like that. <laughs> it happens. We were in an IHOP up in uh, Lynchburg one time, and there was a lady who had the awfulest mouth on her, terrible. And uh, then all of a sudden I heard one of them say, be, be quiet, our pastor's coming. She's like, oh, praise the Lord, brother. Change, you know, that quick. And, uh, you know, and I thought, my goodness, uh, they, they really need to realize they're not fooling nobody. God sees and God hears. Yep, they really are. It, it, it's a sad time that we're living in as far as that's concerned but that's why we need to uplift the name of the Lord I, I think it's so sad that when we go out in public and you hear people talking about problems they're having in their church when they ought to be bragging on their church right. bragging on the Lord you know Should never take nothing bad out you know of that preacher or them singers or this or that you know and, and we ought to be saying man you ought to come down to our church you know and see what God's doing and we love the Lord, and we love you too, and, and there's hope for you, and, and and not fussing and complaining all the time. That's right. That's right. Before I got saved, up our, I worked up our bus company. One day, uh, this guy I worked with, everything come out of his mouth was a curse word. I just got caught. I said, I told him, I said, I think I said that. If I was all that, that I could think of to do, all I could say 